Shakugan no Shana is a series I'm quite fond of, but have complicated feelings for. I have a lot of nostalgia for it, as the anime was one of the first I watched over 10 years ago. But every time I've rewatched it since then, my fondness for the series dwindled. With the exception of the final season, which has always been my favorite of the three seasons that it has. This complicated my feelings even more, as it's generally regarded as the worst season by fans. The series is about a mysterious and powerful fighter named Shauna, and her fateful encounter with a young boy named Yuji. He's introduced to her world and learns that everything he once knew is much different than he thought, full of monstrous beings the natural world doesn't know about that consumes humans and the otherworldly warriors, like Shauna, that fight these beings. The story afterwards follows these two characters as Yuji learns more about the secrets of the world and encounter more of these beings while Shauna watches over him during his daily life. This is the premise that sold the series in Japan, as it was very successful when it released in late 2002. As of today, the light novel has sold more than 8.6 million copies. Its popularity eventually led it to getting a manga adaptation in early 2005 and an anime adaptation in late 2005. The series eventually made its way to other parts of the world due to its success. In the West specifically, we ended up getting all three mediums and at least some form. The anime did relatively well here as we got all three seasons dubbed into English, which isn't that surprising considering that anime was starting to blossom in the West around that time. The manga didn't do quite as well as the anime, but like, we still got most of it over here. That's something. The light novels came over to the West in some capacity. That's pretty cool. You can even hold physical copies of them in your hands. Yeah. <sighs> This video was originally about something else entirely. I came into this video with the intent of discussing that season 3 is the best season of the anime. However, as I started my research on the series, it very quickly became about something much more tragic regarding all three mediums that deserves to be talked about. So, instead of focusing on season 3, we're going to start at season 1 and compare that to what we have of the source material. Doing that will fully convey just how tragic the state of the series has become in the West. Basing off what we have of the light novel, as well as comparing that to both the manga and the anime, the light novel is the best way to experience the series, and the manga stays pretty close to the source material as well. However, the anime is another story altogether as it is not only mostly unfaithful to the source material, but the ending result of the adaptation leaves a lot to be desired. The purpose of this video is not to try and convince those of you who love the anime that it's bad. Your opinion is just as valid as mine. However, I tear into the anime in this video and end up being very critical of it. So, if you like the series, Series, that may not be something you'd enjoy seeing. But do know that despite the overall negative tone of this video, this is a series that I love. However, after learning about the state of the series outside of Japan, I can't help but talk about it. So, as we go through the series and compare the anime to what we have of the source material, the sad and unfortunate state of Shakugan Oshana outside Japan will become apparent. Something you should know before we start is that I'll be citing the light novel a lot, but I'll be using the imagery of the manga to portray it since that'll be a lot easier to understand than just having words on screen. The manga is a faithful adaptation despite it not having as much detail as the light novel, so I'll mostly be using both synonymously. The anime actually does start off well. The beginning of the series across all three mediums are mostly the same. It starts off with Yuji's normal life and him narrating about simple things, but there's no time to think about that because time just froze and everyone's getting eaten! Within a minute and a half of the episode starting, it throws us into the supernatural aspect of the show immediately as its hook. The surrounding area is covered in a red tint, and time seems to have been frozen by these monstrous beings, who are… drinking people. I guess. There's a freakish baby looking monster and it's about to eat Yuji, but he's suddenly saved by a mysterious young girl with a sword in a trench coat, who then proceeds to kill all the monstrous beings. The girl and her pendant, which can talk by the way, notice Yuji and refer to him as a Mistus. She then attacks some lady that was behind Yuji, presumably about to attack him. The series does a good job in the first few minutes trying to hook the audience with its unfamiliar world and throwing around terms that mean nothing to the audience yet. The mysterious girl's design screams early 2000s cool and edgy, and whose introduction gives her this mysterious aura, and it's interesting not knowing exactly who this is. That is until the lady recognizes her, and reveals her name, title, physical description, class, contractor, the contractor's name and title, and her social security number to the audience. <laughs> Frame 
Wow, that sure is a convenient bit of information for the audience. So this girl is named Shauna, and she's about to finish off the random lady, but Yuji tries to stop her. But to his surprise, the lady stabs her freaking hand through his back as if she's trying to reach for something. Shauna continues her attack and cuts both the lady and Yuji. Some kind of doll jumps out of the lady's cut up body and flies away, and Yuji is practically cut in half. But he doesn't feel any pain, and there's no blood. Shauna fixes up Yuji, and then uses magic or something to fix up the broken scene and everything turns back to normal. So, with the confusing and mysterious opening out of the way, the audience should have a lot of questions. It uses Yuji to ask these questions for us since he's just as confused. The way it tries to answer all of these questions is through info dumping. HEAVY info dumping. Yep, the series uses exposition to try and catch the audience up to speed, which wouldn't be that big of a problem if the series wasn't so freaking convoluted. Man, there are just so many things about this series, so many concepts, so many made up terminology that it expects us to pick up on and be familiar with right away, and it is all through exposition. It info dumps all this information to Yuji and the audience, and even though they explain it thoroughly, it can still be difficult to keep up with everything. Feeding us a little information at a time and using examples instead of just telling us would have been a lot more effective. This isn't just an anime only problem either, it's just a series staple, though the manga and light novel do seem to to do a better job at this and doesn't repeat information too often after the beginning chapters. And now we're presented with a problem because if we don't know this terminology, we'll just be lost. As much as I want to reveal this information gradually, the show uses the first few episodes to explain everything and then moves on without slowing down. So in order to not spend an obscene amount of time presenting this information as if it's a lecture given by a college professor, I'm going to simplify it as much as I can now and then tell you other important information you need to know when you need to know it. There's an alternate world known as the Crimson Realm where beings called Crimson Denizens reside. These beings found a way to cross the rift between their and our world, but because they're not from our world, they can't survive without the essence called Power of Existence, which humans naturally possess. So in order for them to survive in this world, they need to consume humans' power of existence, which is what we saw that baby thing do earlier. Doing this causes the balance of the world to go out of whack which is bad. They make distortions happen, which is kind of all we get for an explanation on what that even means. Crimson denizens can be split up into two groups. Those who are consuming power of existence at their leisure, let's call this group regular denizens, and those who don't like what their people are doing and are trying to stop them. Let's call this group contractors. The contractors started making contracts with humans to fight crimson denizens using the contractor's power. They dwell inside these humans as to not need to consume power of existence. Humans who have made contracts with contractors <laughs> Humans who have made contracts with contractors are called flame hazes. In order for the contractors to voice their will, the flame hazes are given an accessory of some kind that acts as a communicator. Shauna is a flame haze, and Alistair, the pendant, is her contractor. You're not lost yet, right? Okay, good, let's keep going. When humans are consumed by crimson denizens, their existence is literally erased, and no one remembers or thinks about these people ever again. These people suddenly being erased is what throws the world out of balance. So to counteract this, flame hazes make a temporary replacement for them that slowly fades over time. These are called torches. Shauna explains to Yuji that he is not actually the real Yuji, but one of these replacement torches. The real Yuji was eaten by a denizen sometime before the events of the story. So logically, that means that this this Yuji only has a limited amount of time left before he fades away. Okay. I think we're good for now. I think these concepts are actually pretty neat. Even with not knowing everything that's going on because there's just so much info to take in, we can at least understand that this isn't the real Yuji, and not even human. Shauna and Alistair refer to him as an object, a thing, and during these episodes you'll notice that a lot of the dialogue exchanges between Shauna, Alistair, and Yuji sound very repetitive and awkward. And once again, this is because the show is heavy on exposition from the get-go, and to make sure the audience fully grasps its concept, Yuji just kind of repeats the same questions, but in a slightly different way, over and over again. ボクが死んでる。なんで。言ったでしょ。偶然の友柄に食われたって。当時であるお前が消えるってこと。消えるって。あ、自分がサカユージがもう死んでるだなんて。本当に消えるわけ。何度も同じこと言わせないで。僕
Yeah, just in case you needed a reason to hate Yuji, here you go. He remains oblivious for a while, and it's really annoying. Not that I'm trying to project my hate of Yuji onto you or anything, but Yuji freaking sucks, you should hate him. The dialogue in these episodes is an unfortunate example of Tell Not Show, and I think it's to its detriment in more ways than one. I said before that the show is very convoluted, but that itself is only half true. It's not that the show is super complicated, it just shoves our faces with so much exposition that it's hard to keep up with everything unless you're taking notes. This, in a way, makes the audience feel like the show doesn't trust us with the information it's giving us, making it feel like we're being spoon-fed. And I'm not saying that you need to reveal this information over the course of the entire show. If you want the audience to understand everything near the beginning, then that's fine. But like, let us absorb that information by seeing it. During these episodes, it's revealed that Yuji is a special kind of torch because he's the main character. He has a mystical item inside of him, and torches that have these items are called mystices. And these items inside the mystices are called treasures. This makes Yuji a bigger target for denizens than the average person, which also puts everyone around him in danger. So to keep an eye on Yuji, Shauna takes the existence of a torch that was was about to go out, who was a classmate of Yuji's, and takes the identity of that person at his high school. This is the premise and setting the show settles with. A magical fantasy battle shonen where Shauna and Yuji deal with denizens, mixed with a slice of life high school romance where Shauna starts to develop unfamiliar emotions, mostly feelings of love and attraction. The show tries to appease fans of all these genres, and the results, at least in the anime, are a mixed bag. So with a flame haze in high school, a bunch of shenanigans ensue because Shauna doesn't know how to act like a normal person. But there's no time to think about that because the denizen from before is back and froze time again! Except, she still sucks and is defeated in one hit that basically destroys the entire classroom and everyone in it. Even with the problem season 1 has, there are still some highlights, like this scene. Yuji looking in horror at his classmates is actually pretty haunting and conveys the kind of consequences that are possible in this world. Not exactly like the light novel, but this scene proves that it doesn't need to be exactly the same to be a good adaptation. The anime puts more emphasis on the damage done to his friends than the light novel, which focuses more on the fight with the doll, as it lasted a little longer and was more extravagant. It's a great scene, as the music here gives an intense vibe, and combined with the imagery of everyone frozen within the seal being injured, it's really effective. The seal was set up by the denizen Fry... Agne. Fry... Fry Agne? Hunter Fry Agne. That is what I'm called. Okay then. The seal was set up by the denizen Friagne, the treasure hunter. He is the one that created the doll that Shauna fought in episode 1, and just barely. Living things that are created by denizens are called Rene, just one more term to throw in your repertoire. He made the school into a battle zone, putting everyone in danger. And like we already established, the first hit of the fight destroyed the entire classroom and caused some serious damage to the people who are frozen in the seal. Shauna and Friag... <sighs> Shauna and Fragne don't fight though, as Alistair warns her that this is a very powerful denizen, and Fragne doesn't want to damage the treasure inside of Yuji. After Fragne leaves, Shauna is about to use one of Yuji's friend's power of existence to fix up the broken scene, but Yuji stops her and asks to do it with his remaining power of existence instead, which shocks her as torches are usually very selfish and hang on to what little life they have remaining. After the scene is fixed and the day has passed, Shauna sees that Yuji's weak flame suddenly ignites to full strength again, which makes Alistair figure out the treasure inside of Yuji, but doesn't let the the audience know yet. This is where things finally get rolling. The complicated world is finally established and the author can do cool things with it. And he does. While the series across all three mediums struggles with exposition and awkward dialogue, once everything is explained, as hard to follow as it may be, things pick up pretty drastically. At least, in the light novel and manga. This is around the part of the series where you need to start separating the anime from the light novel. The first 14 episodes covers what's supposed to be the first three arcs of the series, but the anime takes a lot of creative liberties in in this regard with anime original content, combining the first two arcs into one, and skipping over a lot of the source material. These things aren't inherently bad, you can definitely pull these things off successfully, but why else would I be mentioning it? The anime doesn't do it well. So this arc in the anime not only introduces the villainous treasure hunting denizen, but introduces an antagonistic flame haze who is hunting for a completely different denizen who peacefully collects torches. It juggles these storylines, and it's not difficult to follow per se, it just makes things feel overstuffed. Like there's too much happening and not enough time to give the story room to breathe. So as if we didn't have enough to keep track of already within the first four episodes, the show introduces Marjorie, the flame haze we just spoke about. Her denizen contractor is Marjorie. 
Marco, the book she carries around. And with their introduction, we learn that some flame haze don't exactly work well together. Marjorie's thing is that she just hates denizens and wants to kill all of them, which isn't what a flame haze's duty is, so she butts heads with a lot of other flame haze. She's out searching for the corpse collector, a denizen who's an exception from the norm as his actions don't cause the balance of the world to be disrupted. Regardless of if you've soaked in all the information and character introductions, the show continues to move on. This is almost the opposite problem you have with having a lot of filler. The show is trying to stuff as much content from the source material as possible that it becomes taxing to watch. It's a show that probably benefited a lot from having a weekly watch schedule. With so much information needing to be fit in such a short time frame, other aspects of the show were affected as well, the most important of which is Shauna's feelings and character development. In the light novel, Shauna starts experiencing feelings that she isn't familiar with. Feelings of frustration, jealousy, infatuation, and so on that happens gradually as she spends time with Yuji, none of which she understands. But instead of doing it gradually because two arcs are happening at once, the anime has her start feeling this way with one scene. The PE teacher was being a jerk to everyone in class, making them run laps for the entire class period and making someone even almost pass out. When Shauna was fed up with it, she was going to punch him, but Yuji notices this and tells her to kick instead, what she does. This simple thing leaves her to a flurry of emotion and frustration because she listened to a torch of all things. They want the emotions to remain just as strong, but for something that honestly isn't a big deal at all. As you can probably guess, this was something she barely thought about in the light novel. In fact, after the teacher gives up and runs away, she was going to chase after him before Yuji has to stop her. Shauna is in such distress about what Yuji told her to do in the heat of the moment, that as soon as she senses something odd going on, she has for it immediately to get her mind off of it. This all happens within a couple of minutes, by the way. The something odd she sensed was Marjorie opening a seal in an attempt to locate the corpse collector. Shauna arrives, and Marjorie and Marco recognize her and Alistair and waste no time to begin fighting. This fight actually stays relatively close to the source material, but because they skipped all the context that led up to it, including Shauna starting to develop feelings for Yuji, it makes the fight emotionally hollow and just really silly. This fight takes place in the second volume of the light novel, and volume 4 of the manga, so a lot has already happened in the series at this point. So what is the context that the anime is lacking to make this scene great? Well, Yuji has another love interest that is trying very hard to make him like her. Her name is Yoshida, and she's a relevant character throughout the rest of the series. Yuji and Yoshida go on a date, and Shauna is going through a lot of confusion and jealousy right now, and is in emotional pain. This is also around the time Yuji is avoiding Shauna, because he He's an idiot. Yuji, being the dingus he is, was distancing himself from Shauna a little because he didn't want to seem uncool around her while battling with her, despite him asking her to train him and being an embarrassment just by existing. Yuji just, he just sucks across all mediums, okay? But anyway, that's why she took the first opportunity to get her mind off of it. As you can probably guess, she is so distracted from all her negative feelings that she gets destroyed in her fight with Marjorie, which is devastating to read as it just piles onto her negative feelings and makes the situation even worse. But everything that's happened to this point just builds up to crucial moments that happen later, like the emotional scene where Yuji finds Shauna after she's defeated. But because the reason for Shauna's strong and complicated feelings is so minuscule in the anime, it's difficult to determine what exactly she's feeling. Is she really so annoyed that she listened to Yuji's advice? Is that simple thing really enough for her to not be able to concentrate on fighting at all? Is it the same as in the light novel and she's already infatuated with Yuji to the point where she can't think about anything else? Either way, the end result just seems like Shauna isn't actually that good at fighting, or at the very least is inconsistent at it. The first episode gave the impression that she was not only good at fighting, but was a respected and revered Flame Haze. The fight afterwards in episode 3 lasted 5 seconds so it wasn't enough to change our first impression of her. But after that fight, and for the rest of the arc, you'll start to notice that any major fight Shauna is in, she is just immediately curb stomped right away. But as the show progresses, this changes from her being terrible at fighting to her being terrible at fighting, but only when Yuji isn't there. A very stark contrast to how freaking cool she is in the light novel, portraying how skilled she is at fighting despite not being able to use Alistair's full power. Every fight from the first volume demonstrated this and affirmed our first impression of her. She's a big threat to her opponents. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It's difficult not to when this fight takes place in volume 2 of the light novel after they've already dealt with Free Agne. You just need to compare the two scenes from after her fight with Marjorie to see the difference the emotion 
emotional impact makes. Shauna is so much more vulnerable in the light novel, yelling at Yuji about how she doesn't understand why she's feeling the way she's feeling and how he needs to become stronger so he can stay by her side. Anime Shauna is overall a lot more stoic in general, but even still, the somber atmosphere in the scene is reduced to nothing as she just slaps Yuji's hand away in frustration when he checks to see if she's okay. And the source of her anger, I'd like to remind you, is that Yuji told her to kick instead of punch and that caused so much psychological damage that she is no longer able to think straight. This is the result of them combining these arcs into one, trying to fit as much content as possible but without the buildup or payoff. So with two very important arcs being combined into eight episodes, you'll notice that things are not only left out but are rearranged. The date that Yuji and Yoshida went on while Shauna was fighting Marjorie in the light novel now takes place afterwards in the next episode of the anime. Yoshida has a massive crush on Yuji and that's pretty much the entirety of her character and won't be much of anything else until later on. She started liking Yuji because he stood up for Yoshida when the mean teacher was making everyone run laps. You know, the kick scene. So she asks Yuji out, they go on a date to an art museum, and they run into the corpse collector, where he talks about how he's collecting torches for some vague purpose and asks Yuji if he's certain that he's the real Yuji, which surprises him for some reason since Shauna has been explaining that to him for the last four episodes and has more or less accepted the fact that he's not. He also tells Yuji for Agni's plan that he somehow knows and that is to devour the whole city's power of existence. Yuji decides that he needs to act now and just dips on his date with Yoshida, and like, okay, the city's in danger, so whatever. And during all this, Friagni and Marjorie have a fight that amounts to nothing. And Alistair tells Shauna, who is still frustrated with Yuji, that they need to destroy Yuji so she can get back to focusing on her job. The episode leaves us with that cliffhanger, which makes it seem like it's a bigger deal than it ends up being. So Friagni decides to conveniently start his plan as soon as the audience knows about it and pulls out a bell that has vague powers that aren't fully explained. <laughs> Yuji explains to Shauna Free Agni's plan as they presumably walk home, and Shauna is having an internal conflict about what Alistair said about killing Yuji and finally decides to take her sword out and is about to strike him before she hesitates. And Free Agni's city devouring ceremony begins, which Shauna heads for immediately. The plot point that was teased about Shauna needing to kill Yuji is never brought up ever again. It awkwardly transitions into a fight where Shauna doesn't lend a single hit on Free Agni because of course she doesn't. The show obviously didn't have a great budget when it came to animation in general, and it's incredibly apparent in the fight scenes. While other anime from the same era, or even earlier, can be seen with smooth animation and great choreography to make fights entertaining to watch, you'd find it very difficult to convince me that this show put any thought into its fights at all. The animations during these scenes are surprisingly stiff and lack any sort of choreography or strategy at all, which makes it overall uninteresting to watch. Not only that, but it just makes these attacks seem so slow and easy to anticipate that it's frustrating to see the super-powered firebender with a sword getting so easily bested by them. In this fight, you'll come to see that she doesn't so much as touch Free Agne until the final blow. Shauna charges and cuts a doll-looking thing, it disperses into clumps of energy, floats around for a bit, and then home to Shauna and hit her. Shauna and Free Agne stare at each other, he flips a coin, obviously an attack of sorts knowing what we know about the show. You'd think she should be on her guard, but she just lets him do his thing and eventually wraps a chain around her sword. I know this is supposed to be like cinematic timing or whatever, but can it be conveyed just a bit more clearly, please? Just so it doesn't seem like Shauna is waiting for the attack to happen? In the light novel, when he uses this attack, Shauna is already hurling downward towards him about to strike, so it seems like it comes out very quickly. A lot of the fights in season 1 are like this. The fight starts, Shauna gets destroyed, Yuji either shows up or is mentioned in some way, and she gains a Super Saiyan level power boost and is able to gain the upper hand in battle. It's stupid and silly and I hate it and it sucks. Season 2 incorporated a lot more strategy into the fights, and Season 3 had a much higher budget and made the fights actually fun to look at, thank goodness. But for now, it's just frustrating. Anyway, Shauna is getting destroyed, and Yuji shows up because he thinks he can help, and I'm not kidding, literally immediately gets kidnapped. It takes 12 seconds after he shows up, and it's so funny. He takes Yuji and tells Shauna to come and find him, more or less. And so... She does. Alright, so I won't go over every change that happens in this scene from the light novel because there are just so many, but we need to cover the core changes because we need to see just how badly they botched this scene. First of all, Yuji is already there when the fight starts. Shauna and Yuji lure for Agni there by eliminating weak torches around the city, which are essential parts of his plan. While the anime tries to establish Yuji as some strategical fighting genius that Shauna can't fight without right away, the light novel is more gradual. In fact, in this fight in the source material, 
material, it's Shauna who's telling Yuji to do things, like to duck and to look out. Despite what the light novel says about her not being able to use Alistair's full power, she's actually capable at fighting. Fragne summons some dolls and Shauna makes easy work of them. During the fight, Yuji is observing Fragne's movements and sees that he pulls out a bell from earlier and notices torches within the dolls, and that when the bell rings, the flames inside the dolls and his torch as well begin resonating, quote unquote. This somehow gives him the idea that something isn't right and tells Shauna to get away from the dolls just as they explode. She obviously survives, but the fact that Yuji saw the power of Fragni's dolls makes him even more curious about what treasure is inside of Yuji. And that's what makes him ultimately start to aim for Yuji. And I gotta hand it to the manga. They nail the facial expressions for these characters, and it adds a lot for me. Shauna tries to reach Yuji before Fragne, but he beats her to Yuji and tries to redirect Shauna's attack to Yuji so he can more easily reach the treasure inside of him. But Shauna stops herself before she can hit him, to the shock of everyone as Yuji is still seen as an object at this point. Fragne's look of confusion turned to menacing as he realizes that a flame haze of all things has started to care for a torch is very effective at conveying what exactly is happening. Shauna's look of distress and anger as she sees Yuji's frightened face as he is taken away also does a very good job at helping us see inside the character without it being blatantly told to us. It's just so good. I love stuff like this. So the reason why Fragne takes Yuji and leads Shauna to the tallest part of the city in the light novel is because he says his plan is to use one of his treasure tools to blow her up, and he doesn't want the torches in the city to get caught up in that explosion. Though this explanation was itself a distraction from his real plan, but I'll get into that later. But because the anime doesn't go go over any of this, they kind of just throw in a random line near the end of the fight about how being on the ground would reveal that Fragne has put his plan into action. Speaking of the anime, Shauna follows Fragne to the tall building and continues to get tossed around and Yuji starts to feel useless because he is. He decides he doesn't want to be useless anymore and starts to tell Shauna to avoid attacks and what actions she should be taking to avoid damage. And suddenly, Shauna can actually put up a fight as her body just naturally does as he says, which also gives her some kind of power up? Fragne sees that she He's gotten more powerful and starts using his bell to initiate his city devouring plan. He just sits there ringing his bell, and who knows what Shauna is doing during all this because it sure does seem to take a while. Oh, she's just casually walking towards him while he does his thing. It's okay Shauna, there's no need for urgency. It's not like you haven't landed a single hit on this guy or anything. Her menacing walk is enough to have the doll fear for the safety of Fragne and sacrifices herself in an attack. The freaking doll that Shauna was actually able to defeat from the first episode just steps up and does a whatever attack and it just freaking works. Just when she was looking all calm and collected from her power up, nope, screw you Shauna, you can't look cool in your own show, are you crazy? I'm really starting to feel bad for her. So like, with Shauna wounded, Fragne pulls out a random freaking gun, but like, not just any random freaking gun, I guess, and then Yuji climbs up the ladder to be with Shauna, and Fragne says he's going to use Yuji to power the special gun he has, and now both of them are too hurt to stand. <sighs> it's just... I wish I could feel any tension here, but none of this feels earned. Like, obviously the good guys are going to win because that's just how these things usually go, but it's been a very one-sided fight so far, so you know it's just gonna end in some stupid BS. He's about to shoot, but Yuji tells Shauna to get up and she throws some broken glass at Fragne, cutting off some of his fingers and dropping his gun. The fire repellent ring that Fragne always had, and I forgot to tell you about, falls next to Yuji and he picks it up and keeps it for the rest of the series as a handy dandy way of not dying while getting caught up in the literal heat of battle. Fragne picks up the gun again, is about to shoot, but Marjorie shows up and shoots the gun from his hand. Shauna and Fragne then charge at each other, and oh my gosh, Shauna actually landed a hit, and it was enough to kill him, it's a freaking miracle. After the battle, Yuji is about to disappear because a bunch of power of existence was stolen from him, but at midnight his torch recharges, and that's when they reveal what treasure is inside of Yuji. It's called the Midnight Lost Child, and its function is giving limitless power of existence. And every day at midnight, Yuji's flame recharges, so his torch is in incapable of fading away. After the ordeal, Marjorie shows herself since, you know, she never left after helping Shauna defeat Fragni. <laughs> Let's go back to the light novel and manga. The conclusion of this fight in the light novel is so cool. And I know just saying that is mostly subjective, but I never said I was being objective to begin with. This is all my opinion. Stop being so uptight. It is so freaking cool. So something I didn't mention from when Fragne first brought Yuji to the tall building was that the gun he has is actually a treasure tool that, when a flame haze is shot, their shell is shattered and the contractor is released from their body. And because Alistair is a crimson god, one of the most powerful crimson denizens out there, his body 
is enormous and also engulfed in flames. So when he said his plan was to make Shauna explode on top of that building, that's what he meant. To have Alistair burst out of Shauna and make a big boom. But later, Yuji realizes that Free Agni telling him all this was a distraction from his city devouring plan. Yeah, all that painful on the nose villain speech dialogue was actually used to subvert expectations. Free Agni still plans to use the gun, but he wanted to divert attention away from the bell. Anyway, Shauna is actually giving Free Agni and the doll a hard time because she's actually awesome in the source material, and I can't stress that enough. ま、でも震えまへいすとは全く違う。普通のフレームヘイスなら仕掛けてきた炎の攻撃を日よけの指輪で防いだ隙に鳥が to make a long story short, after a long fight and Marianne sacrificing herself, he does actually manage to shoot Shauna with Trigger Happy after losing some fingers. Shauna falls off the building, but instead of a huge explosion, a seal comes from her and Alistair appears from it and looms over Free Agne menacingly. He then proceeds to tell him how freaking cool Shauna is, saying that she's the Great One, a rare human with a vessel strong enough to contain a crimson god, a vessel so strong that Trigger Happy was unable to shatter it. Alistair then obliterates Free Agne with no effort at all and it's freaking awesome. Call it plot armor or whatever, I don't freaking care. Take your objectivity garbage and throw it out the window. This is the kind of stuff that gets me hyped. I was raised on Dragon Ball, what can I say? So there was actually a movie made later on that follows the source material, well, more closely at least. And the movie ends with Alistair obliterating Fragne in this way. The movie is much better than the first six episodes. You know, not for that reason alone, but you get it. So I just covered a lot of the anime chronologically, but it was to demonstrate just how different the source material is from the anime. I don't plan on covering everything, but I need to make my point somehow. The remainder of the arc, covering Marjorie, suffer from similar problems, but it's difficult to really compare them to the light novel when so much of the second arc was skipped. I guess the first thing to mention is that when Marjorie first appeared, she basically recruits two of the side characters, named Seto and Eika, as lackeys. It's kind of awkward in the anime because she just casually casually reveals the truth of the world to them, and they just accept it immediately like it's no big deal. Their reactions are similar in the light novel, except it explains that the two boys were too entranced by Marjorie's beauty to care. She basically hypnotized them with her good looks. Yuji asks Shauna to train him so he can stop being useless, and it's like the most inefficient training in the world, with Shauna just hitting Yuji with a stick and telling him to feel the kill as if that means anything, and how that's the most important ability you can have in battle. She literally tells him to stop thinking as if he's already had years of training and has it down to muscle memory. Yuji, you stupid idiot, just feel Shauna's sense for the kill and go ultra instinct on her, bro. And it's so freaking funny because after her explanation, Yuji is just like, oh, why didn't you say that in the first place, Lamau? Okay, I'm ready to get hit on the head some more. And this training continues through seasons one and two. Even with the rules the anime has set up in this world, this training just seems so pointless. Are they trying to awaken some kind of otherworldly ability inside of him, or legit actually train his physical prowess and combat skills? The light novel has a similar explanation that makes just as much sense. The key to outmaneuvering your opponent is not technique. The important thing is this, you must feel the kill. Give me a break. Even Yuji has to ask what that means, and she just doesn't answer him. Feel my intent to kill, she says, as she attacks Yuji, holding back so she doesn't kill him. How can you even train with a system like this if feeling the opponent's kill is vital to not being killed? Wouldn't having that intent while training someone result in you actually attempting to kill that person? That is her intent, right? To kill? Her aim, her objective, her purpose, her meaning, her goal? is to kill, right? Why isn't Yuji dead? Wait, I'm supposed to be showing the light novel in a positive light, right?
Look, everything you love is imperfect, all right? Things can still have flaws and be good, okay? I mean, I don't know. Perhaps later in the light novel it goes into more detail about this freaking weird training and maybe it does a better job at explaining it. Who knows? What? You know, don't you? Huh? You read the light novel in the manga, right? Correct. So you should know the answer. Yeah, but I don't. What? But you read the source material! I suppose fighting in the series is more about feelings rather than actual fighting ability? Okay, yeah, sure, good enough for me. Let's just move on. Shauna and Marjorie start fighting over the corpse collector. And Yuji is there from the start, so Shauna is suddenly amazing at fighting. And just in case you think I'm exaggerating that, she literally says so herself. <laughs> Regardless of if emotions really are tied to fighting skill in this series, we don't get any confirmation on that in the anime besides interpreting things that aren't directly said. Is it exclusive to Flame Hazes? Or maybe just Shauna in general since we don't really see Marjorie have any of these power-ups throughout the series? Either way, it implies that Shauna was just awful at fighting before meeting Yuji because now that he's gray Shauna with his presence, she is somehow able to fight Marjorie with no problem. And similar to the last fight with Marjorie, this one stays pretty close to the source material too, but without the context. In the light novel, I wouldn't say it's a straight up curb stomp from Shauna, but it is pretty one-sided. Between her last fight with Marjorie and now, a lot of important story things happened that led to Shauna having much more confidence in herself. And yes, it's because of Yuji. So while the fight with Marjorie is very comparable to the fight with Freyagne in the light novel, in the anime, the stark contrast between Shauna's incompetence in that fight compared to her Super Saiyan power of love fight right here just makes Shauna's fighting skills make no sense at all. But anyway, because Shauna can do anything now, she beats Marjorie with little effort. Oh good, I love this trope. Blatantly telling the audience her backstory. No need to give it to us in a natural way, like gradually over time, or just actually telling the story to one of the side characters she always hangs out with. She just chooses to narrate it to herself. Something I'm sure that we can all relate to. Don't you remember in high school losing that basketball tournament and as soon as the other team scored the winning basket you just started narrating your tragic backstory in your head all at once right then and there? Can definitely relate to Marjorie, she is a very good character. This is kind of one of those unfortunate tropes that works well in written word, but not so great in other mediums. This happens in the light novel, but the transition from the fight to her backstory goes a lot more smoothly as there are no pictures or sounds to work with. So the narrator acts as the mediator between the reader's world and the world of the novel. It just comes off more naturally in that setting, which I can't say about the anime or manga. In these instances, I think a flash of images without any narration would work just as well in order for the audience to understand Marjorie's motivations, especially since she talks about it later with the corpse collector. Oh, right, her actual backstory. Basically, she was a terrible person and wanted to destroy everything that made her life miserable. Before she got the chance to do it though, a denizen in a suit of armor beat her to it and destroyed everything that she wanted to destroy. The reason she became a flame haze in the first place is to find and kill this denizen. This actually becomes important for later, so just keep it in the back of your mind, I guess. So Marco, like, breaks out of Marjorie somehow and is this huge fire creature, kinda like how Alistair did with Shauna in the light novel in their fight with Freyagne, and Shauna charges in with Yuji for the final blow. The crap was Yuji saying about feeling the kill then, exactly. I'm sorry, I just, I just can't get over this. Did she turn off her instinct to kill at the last second as to not kill her? If fighting skills and combat in this world is all about feeling the opponent's intent to kill you and your intention to kill and using your freaking ultra instinct on people, what the crap was Yuji sensing just now? I honestly don't get it. How does power function in this world? Clinging on to her, Yuji felt the moment of her kill. What does that even mean? I'd be fine if Marjorie survived because she's just super strong so Shauna wasn't able to kill her. The light novel mentions her using the back of her sword for the attack so you could argue that she did intend to kill her but at the same time she turned her sword around so her strike wouldn't kill her but that just means she didn't intend to kill her despite having the intent to kill her. Seriously, I just can't wrap my head around. Is it just me or is Marjorie a lot prettier without makeup? What was I talking about?
I mentioned before that Shakugan no Shana tries to combine the shonen and romance genres together into one, and that the anime really struggled with that. And thus far we've talked a lot about the shonen part of the show because it's mostly been the main focus. There have been romance and slice of life aspects to it, but that's kind of been on the sidelines so far. But after the Marjorie arc, it starts to pick up on the romance and slice of life aspect of the show and tries to balance that with the action. The slice of life parts of Shakugan no Shana start off pretty weak, but they're by far the least offensive part of the first 14 episodes. Episodes. It's really interesting when the show brings these two aspects together, having more side characters learn about the truth of the world. But for some strange reason, the slice of life stuff they chose to adapt after the Marjorie arc is the stuff that happened during the Marjorie arc. It's the stuff from the light novel that we've already covered. Yoshida making attempts to get closer to Yuji, Shauna feeling jealous because of it, Yuji distancing himself from Shauna, and so on. So I don't really have a lot to say about how it was adapted besides that it's kind of aimless without the stuff with Marjorie. Yuji and Shauna's goals were tied to the denizen world even during the school life parts of the light novel. So, because the conflict with Marjorie has already been resolved, the ones driving the plot forward are the side characters. They're not bad episodes, I guess, but at the same time, they're kind of difficult to watch. Fortunately, both aspects of the show improve greatly after episode 13. But unfortunately, we still have one more arc to get through before we reach those episodes. And this third arc is really, really bad. Like, makes the first two arcs look like masterpieces bad. And you guessed it, it's only terrible in the anime! While the show is introducing more slice of life elements, it introduces the next obstacle for Shauna and Yuji. A pair of Denizen siblings, Tyriel, the younger sister, and Sorath, the older brother. The older sibling runs into some thugs and is getting beat up until the younger sibling comes in and tells him it's okay to eat them, which he does. It's actually kind of a gruesome scene for the anime, so it stands out of Whoa, 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 stop, 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 what are you doing? Oh my gosh, this is not okay. <laughs> The crap is this garbage? Where's the manga? What happens in the manga? <laughs> yeah, so as it turns out, this arc doesn't actually exist and there's several blank episodes in a row and it's really weird. Let's move on. <sighs> okay, no, but man, there are just so many other cool things going on in this arc in the manga. Like Yuji suddenly going into an existential crisis as he realizes that the treasure inside of him might make him immortal, meaning he will outlive everyone around him except for Shauna. So he immediately latches onto Shauna and thinks that if she stays with him that it won't be so bad and Shauna senses this and tells him that they should stop talking about it. The anime adapts part of this scene, but not the part that has any of the cool things. Like, Yuji still has that dialogue, but it has no emotion behind it. It's pretty watered down. Instead of an existential crisis, who knows what he's even feeling. Actually, there's a lot of scenes or information from this arc that I would best describe as being watered down. And because of that, it doesn't need to include other information, meaning we're missing a lot of content from the source material. Content I personally think makes this arc a lot better. Instead of showing us how menacing one of the new antagonists, Sid Sidone? I'm just gonna say Sydney. His name is Sydney. Instead of showing us how menacing one of the new antagonists Sydney is with a haunting scene of him transforming into a freakish monster to eat someone whole, he's just there, chilling as he watches the other antagonists. Instead of the scene where Alistair is bossing Yuji around to set up a phone conversation with his mom while Shauna is on the roof thinking about all the new feelings she's experiencing, that's just skipped entirely as it goes straight to everything already being set up for them to speak. Instead of the dodgeball scene not only being hilarious but giving heavy emphasis on Yuji and Shauna being jealous by seeing the other person with the opposite sex, the scene removes Yuji seeing Shauna with a guy and is just kind of there to move the plot forward. Which sucks because, as much as I hate Yuji, the series does a good job at creating chemistry between him and Shauna. They bond a lot in this arc in the manga, and it's nice seeing the romance having relevance in the story with actual progress. The anime does include these scenes, but they're so void and lifeless now. Their only purpose being to show that they're in each other's presence instead of showing them flirting, essentially. One scene in particular, Shauna showing Yuji a beautiful view she found, is much more fleshed out in the manga. It shows them talking and teasing each other before even reaching that view, while in the anime it's stripped down to its very core basics with the sole purpose of moving the plot forward with the least amount of effort possible. Character building moments that are gutted like this is practically what this arc is built off of in the anime. Shauna and Yuji's chemistry is gone. Marjorie playing an important role in this arc is essentially cut in half, now only kind of just showing up and 
being present until she runs into Yuji later. We don't get the backstory for Yoshida from the manga on why she started liking Yuji beyond the kick scene, and the internal struggle she's supposed to go through that was so great in the manga is also pretty hollow in the anime. Heck, even Ike has some good moments in this arc as he starts to realize his feelings for Yoshida and how hard it is to deal with that because of how crazy she is for Yuji. But just like the other moments I mentioned, in the anime it's just bare bones. They keep the basic information in these scenes without the extra subtleties. The the only thing they seem to keep is Shauna's unfamiliar feelings, with the rest of the character building being shoved aside for it. And like, yeah okay, she's the main character, but she can only carry the show so much without an interesting supporting cast. Yuji in particular shows hints about what he'll eventually become in season 3 with his thoughts about what's going on in his life and the events around him, but instead of that we get Shauna and a pair of villains that seem to be- <laughs> Why? Why are they like this? Like. I get it. One of the character progressions for Shauna in this arc is learning what her new feelings mean. And specifically, she wants to know why exactly people kiss and what emotion goes behind them. And so the author wanted to use a contrast for her to understand it better. But man, there are just so many other ways to do that. It's depicting lust while Shauna has been hearing this whole arc that there is special meaning behind kissing and like... Why do they have to be siblings? Why do they have to look like they're five years old? What sucks even more is that this arc in the manga is good, but this aspect of it really brings it down. Why do you keep bringing up the manga when the light novels are the source material? Shut up. But I guess we do get some good scenes because of the contrast between the gross siblings and Shauna not being familiar with intimate feelings. The scene where Shauna is asking Yuji's mom about why people kiss is itself really funny because Alistair doesn't want Shauna to know about that kind of stuff or hasn't been able to bring it up yet and doesn't want Yuji's mom to be careless and tell her something that will end up confusing her. But of course, he can't speak up. He ends up getting really mad and blaming Yuji for everything since, you know, it's probably his fault somehow. But anyway, if you liked Alistair being funny and over the top in that scene in the manga, then you don't have to worry because in the anime, they removed any lines Alistair had and just made him be there without saying anything interesting. The scene still serves the same purpose. It's not bad per se, but it is a lot less interesting. Same with the scene where Alistair and Yuji's mom are speaking on the phone. Most of the information is there, but giving Alistair or Yuji's mom any character is mostly stripped away. Alistair's goal is to not have Yuji's mom talk about things like intimacy with Shauna, but this average human woman ends up leading the conversation against a freaking crimson god. Alistair is swayed and intimidated by her in this scene, and hilarity ensues while still moving the plot forward. But once again, it is watered down in the anime. Anyway, let's just get through this arc as fast as possible. So the older sibling wants Shauna's sword because he's a selfish denizen, which is why they're in the city. The manga gives us a lot more screen time with the antagonists than the anime, which in turn gives us a lot more detail about them and what they're capable of. There's practically an entire chapter dedicated to them doing horrible deeds, like cutting people in half, and it's very eerie and chilling, making them seem like even more of a menace than was already established. I suppose the anime conveys the same feelings with all the scenes where the older sibling is just eating people, but I don't think it's nearly as effective. It's like the difference between hearing something happen and actually seeing it happening. This makes them just look evil for evil's sake without the flair of the manga. No, not that kind of flair! Why? Why do they have to kiss? If this keeps up, I'm turning them into monkeys. I'll do it. I can make it fit into the story. You don't think I will, but I'll freaking do it. I don't want to see that garbage. How much left is there? This arc physically hurts me. To establish the power of the siblings, they run into Marjorie and have a simple exchange before leaving, and Marco remarks to the side characters that they were lucky that they decided not to fight them. Personally, I would have liked to see something other than just dialogue to convey that. You know, like in the manga where there's several chapters dedicated to a fight with Marjorie and Sydney and the older sibling and it's awesome! A visual representation like this will leave off a much bigger impression than just a simple implication of being strong like the anime has. At least some interesting things finally start happening with the love triangle subplot when Yoshida confronts Shauna about her relationship with Yuji. They get into a fight where Shauna finally admits that she has feelings for him and right then is when the siblings open up a seal. Shauna tracks them down, but it seems she is unable to go Super Saiyan in this fight as Yuji isn't there to honor her with his presence. At least Shauna actually hits the older sibling once. All you need to do to make a fight interesting is not make it completely one-sided unless there's a reason for it, you know? And like, do I even need to tell you how freaking cool this fight is in the manga? Anyway, five minutes after the fight starts, Shauna tries to figure out where the source of their power is coming from and immediately senses it, goes straight for it, and it's this huge plant thing. She attacks it, but I guess it's too powerful because nothing good can happen to Shauna without Yuji there and the big plant 
plant puts her in the same situation she was in two and a half minutes ago. So the younger sibling explains that the plant is a rene that grows stronger the more it's attacked or something, I don't really care anymore, and the older sibling goes over and takes Sean a sword, oh no. The younger sister asks for a reward and they start <laughs> And a celebration for taking the sword, the monkey denizens do a cute little monkey dance. Haha, <laughs> look at them go. For some strange reason, this makes Shauna think about the conversation she had with Yuji's mom about kissing of all things, and magically figures out the feelings one can put behind a kiss. Hey, good for you, Shauna. Though, Shauna doesn't seem to be a fan of their dancing, as she starts yelling at them about how they're doing it wrong and how it's different from what she knows about dancing. And the older monkey denizen gets offended and threatens to torture her. Meanwhile, Yuji and Marjorie team up and are getting rid of the torches that are powering the plant thing. Shauna feels this and thinks about her relationship with Yuji the Immaculate and receives not only a power-up, but regains the knowledge of how to fight again because the story allows for it now, I guess. Shauna gets her sword back, but she lets the monkeys go free because violence against animals is wrong. In the manga, when Shauna gets trapped by their plant thing, we learn later that she could have freed herself at any time but wanted to stall for Yuji to get rid of the pinions that are powering the sibling's seal. When she finds out Yuji is safe, only then does she break out of their trap and let the monkeys go on their merry way. But because we can't have nice things, the arc isn't over yet because Sydney goes after Yuji and Marjorie and they're in danger. Marjorie and Sydney fight while Yuji tries to find the source of the monkey seal, which ends up being some kind of music box. Sydney makes quick work of Marjorie and comes back to see Yuji, surprising Sydney as a human is walking freely within a seal. He immediately knows Yuji is a mistus and tries to go for the treasure. And it's a tragedy that this scene was changed from the manga because it's one of the only scenes that shows Yuji actually being cool. In the manga, a name pops up a few times. The name of a well-known, powerful dentist in that Shauna got her sword from. If the sword is separated from its user for long enough, this freaking guy in a suit of armor shows up and will stop at nothing to retrieve the sword back to its rightful owner. So when Sydney shows up after beating Marjorie, Yuji knows that he stands absolutely no chance against him and needs to think of how he can stall until Shauna shows up. He remembers the name of this warrior denizen who gave Shauna the sword and tells Sydney that he is that warrior and takes a battle stance, which makes Sydney hesitate to make any actions for like a second before he goes all out on Yuji. But Sydney's fire attack do nothing to Yuji because of the fire-resistant ring he got from Free Agne. And then Sydney is like, oh, okay, this guy actually might be chilling. Like, it freaking works, and it gives Marjorie enough time to come back to the battle. He actually did something useful. But but then it gets even cooler because just before Marjorie gets there, Sydney figures out he's just a Mistis and goes right for the treasure inside of Yuji. And something within the Midnight Lost Child freaking tears Sydney's arm off. Like, what? I love when unexpected things like this happen. It brings up a lot of questions about what exactly is inside Yuji, and if he has a probability of wielding this power in the future. It adds a lot of intrigue. But because the anime doesn't mention the warrior denizen's name at all because of all the watered down content, the anime doesn't do any of this and just cuts straight to Sydney trying to take the treasure inside of Yuji. They don't even do the arm chopping thing as Marjorie comes in in the nick of time to save him. <sighs> okay, let's see. Before Marjorie shows up to save Yuji, she has an emotional scene where she thinks that Eita and Seto got caught up in the wreckage in her battle and are dead. This gives her some characterization and growth and that's nice to see. The manga made things much more emotional and I personally prefer that version, but in this instance I think it's a lot more debatable which scene pulls this off better. In the anime, Marjorie seems a lot cooler and handles her emotions better, and in the manga she's a lot more vulnerable and emotional. Anyway, Shauna shows up during the fight, without the monkeys by the way, I just felt the need to point that out, and destroys the music box. And Sydney runs away as soon as he realizes his monkeys are gone. Done. The end. Despite this arc being terrible in the anime, I hate to say that it's actually pretty good in the manga. I hate saying that because I just, I just freaking hate those siblings so much, dude. It's not even funny. But you guys know that already. I admit their purpose works well for what the author was trying to convey. I just wish he would have done it in literally any other way. Besides the siblings, though, this arc is thoroughly enjoyable. The conflict between the characters are a lot more engaging, and the love triangle feels a lot more genuine. Now, at this point in the anime, things take a pretty interesting turn. It like becomes worth watching. It took me a while to process it, but at around episode 15, I realized that what I was watching was actually pretty good. Not amazing or anything, but a vast improvement from the last 13 episodes. The next three episodes takes place during a flashback with Shauna and a mother-like figure for her named Will Helmina. These names, bro. The flashback goes over Shauna's training to be a flame haze with Wilhelmina on a strange floating island. The best part about this whole thing is that it doesn't just blatantly tell you every little thing that's going on. Some things are just left open for a few episodes so we can think about it. 
actually, the best thing is probably that Yuji doesn't appear for three entire episodes. Everything is just, in general, a lot more structured and better written in the flashback. Actually, from the flashback episode onward, the rest of the season becomes well worth watching as previous problems we've been talking about are reduced dramatically. Still present, but not nearly as much as a detraction as it was before. Shauna now has motivations that push the plot forward. The side characters become more involved in the action side of things, mainly Yoshida. And the story has time to build up and pay off effective moments when before everything seemed very rushed. Unfortunately, this is also the point where we run out of source material to compare the anime to. I've been kind of vague about the light novel and manga success here in the West, but it was to effectively convey just how tragic Shauna's situation is. So now is about the best time to get into that. Information about the history of Shakugan no Shauna in the West is very scarce. While we have the info about official releases, the community efforts for the series is buried deep in the archives of the internet, but I was eventually able to find them. Most of the footage coming up are from the various websites that contain this information. In April of 2007, the first volume of the light novel was released and sold in the West, with Viz Media buying the licensing rights to do so. Releasing it here in the West probably wasn't an easy decision to make despite the light novel selling millions in Japan. Even with mediums like anime and manga starting to blossom in the West in the mid-90s to mid-2000s outside of stuff like Dragon Ball, light novels were, and still are, a completely different story. It's still relatively niche within the anime community today, only having around 200,000 members on the light novel subreddit while various anime and manga subreddits are in the millions. Regardless, we now have the opportunity to buy it and read it for ourselves. So just how successful was the release here in the US? Well. It tanked. We don't have exact numbers online, at least not that I could find, but it couldn't have been good if we only got two volumes out of 22. The only story arcs we have through the light novels here is the Freagne arc and the Marjorie arc. So with the light novel selling so poorly in the US, if you wanted to experience the series, it had to be through another way, meaning the manga and the anime. The manga did do better than the light novel, but not enough to get every volume over here in the West, with Viz only translating six of them, ending right where the light novel left off in volume two. Seems we were destined to get only the first two story arcs, but now you might have the question of how I was able to cover the Monkey Siblings arc if we didn't get it officially translated. The answer is kind of complicated, but it was essentially through fan translations. Fan translations are a miracle given to us from God, giving us the opportunity to experience media that was never officially released in the West. West. The only reason anyone outside of Japan is able to experience Mother 3, for example, is because of dedicated fans. If it weren't for fan translations, many series today would be unavailable to us. For some series out there, fan translations are the only way to experience them, or were for a long time before finally getting officially released in the West. I'd even argue that the popularity of some of these fan translations influenced publishers into finally licensing them. So while making this video, there was hope that the light novel and manga had been fan translated somewhere out there. After all, with how popular the series was back in the day, dedicated fans had to be involved in some way. The easiest fan translation to find is the mangas, because manga is just a lot more popular than light novels are over here. The manga is very faithful to the source material, so besides the light novel, it should be a great way to experience the series. It obviously doesn't have as much detail as the light novel, but compared to the anime, it may as well be one to one. But guess what? We covered it! All of it! The manga covers the first four volumes of the light novel and then just freaking stops, right at the end of the Monkey Siblings arc. That's how I was able to compare the anime to the source material. It was vicariously through the faithful manga adaptation. Ten volumes was definitely not enough to cover the entirety of the light novel. Who knows if sales were low or if there were just internal issues. What's interesting is that it ended the same month and year the light novel did. There's a lot that we just don't know here in the West. Fan translations of the light novel were much harder to find. I had to dig through 10 plus year old internet forums and reddit threads to finally find some leads. But even then, I still had to dig around. I was finally able to not only find fan translations of the light novel, but the community website that did them. The results of my research and findings were… heartbreaking. The fan translation project started on August 5th, 2008 by a fan translation community called Bakasuki who are known for translating light novels, visual novels, and even have some of their own original novels. The project started around 10 months after Viz released Volume 2 of the light novel, which I assume gave them the impression that Viz wasn't interested in publishing it anymore as there was about a 6 months difference between Volumes 1 and 2. Within 3 months, Bakasuki had fully translated Volume 3. For the first year and a half, things seemed to be going very well for them, as they were 
released most of Volume 4, the beginning of Volume 5, and then all of Volume 7. The reason why there were some volumes being skipped is presumably because of the anime. Season 1 had an anime original ending that replaced a lot of Volume 7, so the community opted for that instead of going for Volume 6. Just three days after Volume 7 came out, the project was abandoned. January 28th, 2010. To come out with that big of an achievement just to quit a few days later seems very odd. I was unable to find any discussion on why this happened. There's a thread on the forum that I'm unable to access because I don't have an account and unable to make one. I have seen a lot of discussion about how difficult of a translation Shauna is because of all the made-up terminology, so it's possible that the translators were just tired. Because of Bakasuki's policies, they had to give Viz the benefit of the doubt that they might someday translate volumes 3 and 4 of the light novel, so they had to outright remove the fan translations for those volumes. I looked everywhere for them, but to no avail. They may as well have vanished from the face of the earth. Unfortunately, I don't have all the context for the history of the translations, but just over 13 months later, on February 26, 2011, they decided to revive the project. Perhaps Viz lost the license to the IP around this time, but I wasn't able to find out when they actually lost it. Just a tweet from their Twitter from 2014, so it's possible it happened a few years before that. Either way, it was revived, and six months later they released Volume 8, and then three months after that they released Volume 6... Vo volume 16? So apparently, one of the translators placed a poll on which chapter should be translated first, and um... That one won. Considering the date, that actually makes sense. Volume 16 takes place after Season 2, and in early to mid-2011, Season 3 had still not come out yet. It's just kind of ironic that just a few months later we would be getting an adaptation for it through the anime. And, as far as I can tell, that was the last time Bakasuki did anything with Shauna. It kind of went on hiatus, which at least gave people a glimmer of hope that it might be picked up again eventually. But then in late 2015, that small glimmer of hope was utterly crushed. Bakasuki was hit with a huge DMCA from Katakawa to take down any fan translations from any of their properties, which included Chakugan Oshana and 21 other series. Volumes 5, 7, 8, and 16 vanished from the community website. You can still find them on the Wayback Machine, but any chance of them translating the rest of the series is next to zero. And before going any further, I wanted to highlight the translators and the editors of the project. I imagine that there are some that are missing since the editing history on Bakasuki only goes back to January of 2010. Even though they couldn't translate everything, I commend them for their efforts even under unfavorable circumstances. I wanted to speak to at least one of them, but not only were most of them hit with an inactivity ban in 2015, but, like I said before, I was unable to register an account on the website. This made it impossible to send any messages or look at any important form threads about Shauna's translation. Things kind of get convoluted from here. A few years after that whole fiasco, others tried to pick up the series again to try and complete it, but the interest in it was so low by the time all this happened that they were just all eventually given up on. It even got to the point in 2019 where someone else attempted to machine translate the light novels and then go over them to make them sound more natural. And like, do I even need to tell you why that's terrible? They even admitted that if they were unfamiliar with a term, or if something from the machine translation didn't make any sense, they omitted it. But like, I can't blame these people who attempted to translate the series because people here in the West are just not interested anymore. The anime was definitely not as popular in the US as it was in Japan, but it left its mark. But it's been 17 years since then. Of course things dwindled down. You could just tell by the low attention that these projects were getting that they weren't gonna go anywhere unless it was through sheer passion alone. Remember that it took a group of translators 3-6 to six months to go through one volume. Imagine translating 22 volumes all by yourself that only a handful of people will read. People in the West seem content with just the anime, and that makes me sad. The only other material we have besides the anime is another manga adaptation from the 10th volume of the light novel, which I've read is also quite faithful to the source material. Except that was never translated to the West either! But hey, at least we got a fan translation for half of that! I just feel empty, man. I really struggle with the fact that there's a better version of the series out there that I'll never be able to read. The concepts found in the anime are intriguing, and based off what I've read in the light novel and from people who do know Japanese, those concepts were put to good use. I mean, okay, sure, it's a tragedy, we'll never be able to experience the series in its original form, but you did say that the anime becomes a lot better after the first 13 episodes, right? We can just read the manga and then pick up the anime. I said that the rest of season 1 becomes better.
You didn't have to interrupt? Like, who even are you? That's kind of the root of why this is such a tragedy to begin with. Not only is the anime not a faithful adaptation until season 3, but it's all over the place when it comes to quality too. Having moments of greatness, sometimes even brilliance, and then moments of being just awful. It bounces between the two extremes so often that it honestly becomes exhausting to watch. Until season 3. Don't at me. So even when the anime is good, we still aren't getting the original vision of the creator of the series, which is something that will just always bother me. Strictly talking about what they adapted from the light novels, season 1 adapts volumes 1 through 6, and then bits of volumes 7, 8, and 9 before having an anime original ending, which largely replaces the events of those volumes. Mostly 7. Season 2 skips volume 10, and then uses the first 9 freaking episodes to try and tie the anime original ending from season 1 back to the source material using a mix of anime original content, side stories from separately released light novels, and the freaking PS2 and Nintendo DS games. The rest of season 2 covers volumes 11 to 14, but apparently rushed through them as it seems to skip some important story details according to the timeline article on Shauna Wiki, but who really knows how accurate the wiki is, considering how unfinished it is. Ugh. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that the anime is still a mess, even when you ignore the quality of the writing. You can like the anime as a work of fiction by itself, a lot of people seem to be content with the anime and I'm not here to devalue their opinion, but for people like me who are not satisfied with the anime and would like to read the original source material, we can't. We just can't. So, at this point, even without the source material, I still have a lot to say about the anime. Even though plenty of bad writing shows up, there are still some high points in the last two seasons that cement the fact that us not having the source material is robbing us from experiencing a great series. From this point on, I'm going to kind of blaze through the series to highlight these high points, as well as continue to point out the negatives because the series isn't all sunshine and roses after the first 13 episodes. It's still very much a mixed bag. It also highlights different problems you can run into when you're unfaithful to the source material that you're adapting. You don't need to know exactly every detail of episodes 14 to 24 of season 1, but here's a short summary of what you do need to know. Yoshida ends up finding out the truth of the world through another flame haze that's introduced and finds out that Yuji is a torch. Most everyone from the slice of life part of the series learn about the truth of the world and start to help each other out, which is pretty cool. Eita finds a love interest, Ike becomes a useless background character, and Yuji still sucks. There's a new group of villains called Ball Mosque and they want the Midnight Lost Child. Sydney also being part of this group. They have a plan to do a bad thing that uses the Midnight Lost Child to supply a limitless amount of power of existence, which will severely disrupt the world. So in order to get rid of the bad thing, they come up with a plan to release Alistair from Shauna. You know, like in the first arc from the source material that was so cool. And Yuji is with Shauna and she confesses her feelings to him, but it's unclear if he actually hurt her or not and everything explodes and everything is fixed. Yuji survives because of the fire resistant ring and the season ends showing everyone in class and things are open ended. Much different from what the light novel had according to the the timeline article from the wiki. Look, the wiki is the best thing we have at this point, I'm sorry. As said before, season 1 had an anime original ending, which isn't inherently a bad thing if you do it right. I don't think it's a bad ending myself, but in the grand scheme of things, if you veer away too far from the source, you can have a very difficult time trying to go back to being faithful after making up so much original content. Because JC staff didn't know if Shakugan no Shana was going to be successful or not, they came up with this ending to not only give the anime closure just in case they couldn't make a season 2, but to also leave it open-ended just in case they could make a season 2. But then season 2 was made and they had to answer some questions and implications of season 1's ending. So what they did was make it so that Yuji just didn't hear what Shauna said because the romance needs to stay consistent with the light novel. But with how season 1 ended, they are now apparently so far away from the source material that they felt the need to spend 9 episodes to steer things back on track. Episodes 8 and 9 are from some of the side story volumes and are actually relevant, but I can't say the same about episodes 1 to 7. I don't know if they were in a rush or if they were just making things up as they went, but they spent seven episodes on freaking nothing. It's one of those situations where you can almost skip them entirely and not be lost in the slightest. But because the world is a cruel and unusual place, they decided to add one tiny aspect to these episodes that is needed to fully know what's going on in later episodes. The first two episodes are actually pretty interesting until you realize that they're just recap episodes of the previous season just in case there are people watching that didn't watch the first season. Though I admit it's pretty cleverly disguised. So Okay, never mind. These are the episodes that adapt the PS2 and DS games, so I guess it makes sense that they just briefly go over the plot of those games. 
which briefly goes over the plots of the arcs of the first season. And just in case you're wondering, no, neither of these games were released in the West and you can't download an English patch for the Japanese ROMs. With the recap out of the way, the next five episodes introduces a character that looks just like one of the antagonists of the last arc, Hikate, who's part of Ball Mosque. The show spends a decent amount of time with the characters being concerned about that as well. It's kind of complicated, but this surprisingly isn't Hikate, but unsurprisingly is tied to her. She's like some kind of weird vessel for Hikate that gathers memories for her and combines with her midway through the season. And that is somehow kind of slightly a little bit relevant for some BS plot point they make up for their terrible original ending for season 2. Yep, this is an anime original character, and they use her to try and connect the story back to the source material. I guess? But remember what I said a minute ago, they spend the first seven episodes of season two on basically nothing. And that is essentially what this character is. Nothing. She's introduced and the characters start hanging out with her and spend five episodes focusing on her and how she's inept at being human because she's not actually human and needs Yuji's help for everything and Shauna is jealous and Yuji's an idiot. And it just keeps going and going and going and going. The first episode she's introduced, she needs to take up the entire length of that episode to be familiarized with everyone. And then through the duration of the next four episodes, they eat lunch together, they walk home together, they clean the school pool together, they go and eat ramen, Yuji visits her house to pick her up for school, they all have a study session, they go to the freaking amusement park together, and during this time, Shauna and Yoshida stop being jealous and start to actually like what's her face too. And you'd think! With the amount of time they just spent focusing on whoever she is and the entire cast developing a friendship with her that she'd be so freaking important to the story. So something I want to highlight is the midway point of the season, because it's a great example of how often the quality of the writing can shift between episodes and even within the same episode. Season 2 seems to be full of these examples, almost in rapid succession. It started off on a very, very long low point and then bounces back with several episodes that are very good. Some that I'd consider to be the best episodes of the anime across all three seasons. I've been largely negative towards the show thus far, but I haven't really gone over just how good the show can be. Episodes 8 and 9 focus on some side stories with a Marjorie flashback that gives her a little more backstory and has some great buildup for the coming episodes. It leads to what finally kickstarts the first story arc in season 2, and I cannot begin to tell you how relieving it was to finally have something interesting happen. If you'll remember from the Marjorie arc from season 1, Marjorie's whole thing is that some denizen in a suit of armor, called the Silver, destroyed everything that she wanted to destroy, essentially taking everything away from her, and now her whole purpose in life is to get revenge. This denizen had a silver flame displayed around it instead of the red flame-like aura that we're used to seeing, and this had a lot of build-up for being a big deal. Fast forward to the end of episode 9. Shauna and Yuji are still at it when it comes to training, and Yuji is actually getting the hang of a few things to the point where Shauna thinks he can handle opening a seal. <laughs> He manages to do it, but as he does, to everyone's surprise, he displays a silver flame. And this raises a lot of mystery and intrigue that the series hasn't seen since... Episode 1. Holy crap. Even Alistair is losing his composure. This is a big deal. And for the first time in the series, Yuji actually feels important. Who is he? Why does he have this power? How is he connected to what happened to Marjorie all those years ago? How- How is this not the first episode of season 2? They tell Yuji to not use his power of existence until they know exactly what's going on, because if Marjorie saw Yuji with a silver flame, his life would be in grave danger. They then spend several episodes focusing on the Flame Haze characters investigating what is happening with Yuji, and it's pretty interesting. There's also a bunch of slice of life stuff happening with the cast working on the school festival and it's actually relevant to the characters and their progression. The Flame Haze end up finding out that the treasure inside of Yuji was made by someone named Phyllis and her lover, and a long time ago her lover was sealed inside the treasure. They suspect that Phyllis will one day try to take the treasure back from Yuji, and soon. Yuji basically has a giant target on his back and multiple parties could try hitting him all at once if anything goes wrong. Q episode 13. It's time for the school festival and every major character is present. During the festival, Sean is about to confess her feelings to Yuji in front of everyone, but there's no time to think about that because a new denizen appears in a freaking tornado and everything is thrown into chaos. This denizen ends up being Felis, and she immediately goes to Yuji and starts referring to him as Johan and that she'll never leave him again, and Yuji freaks out and puts up a seal, which reveals his silver flame. Marjorie sees the flame and instantly goes berserk, thinking she's finally found the silver after looking for it for all these years. Everything just goes bonkers incredibly quickly, and it's great. I cannot stress enough how good this episode is. Having multiple 
multiple storylines coming together all at once was really fascinating and really entertaining, and there's actual stakes involved. There are three different parties with completely conflicting goals, all relating to Yuji who finally feels like a main character instead of being there for the ride. Every character is important now, not just the characters that can move inside the seal, but even characters outside of it, who are frozen and are in danger. The two side characters who are uncomfortably attached to Marjorie, Sato and Eika, are suddenly in danger of her as she has such narrow tunnel vision to destroy the silver that she has no regard for the lives around her. She ends up seriously hurting Oga, who uh, you don't know because we skipped a lot, but her and Eika have a thing for each other, making it so that if the seal goes down during all this, aka Yuji dying or going unconscious, she will just die. This is really psychologically damaging to Eika. To have Marjorie, a person he looks up to, do something like this to someone other than a denizen, and to see Oga being caught up in the collateral damage and seeing her in such a haunting, lifeless state is just all too much for him to handle. Seto, who has been wanting to help Marjorie fight the denizens, laments the fact that he's weak and can't do anything but try and talk some sense into her. I don't know exactly how well this episode follows the source material, I've heard some mixed things, but I really have to commend JC staff because this episode is really effective. It can be really easy to screw up the source material when you're adapting something, as we've seen previously, but the last few episodes, especially this one, shows that they are capable of great things. And it's really weird that the first time the anime makes me feel emotional in any way is from the goofy side character that we've barely thought about up until this point, with him overjoyed that Oga is okay after the whole mess is over. Yoshida is also getting a lot of characterization in these episodes finally. I don't think it's inherently bad to have a character start off with having only one or two traits, like being in love with the main character, as long as it builds from there, you know? I like how Yoshida feels that she can't really be part of Yuji's world, that she can't help with the problems they're going through, that she can only observe. I'd like to see this explored further. It's similar to Seto, but like, slightly different. Look, Shakugan no Shana isn't Shakespeare, okay? Marjorie does end up finally calming down after she sees what she's done to Eika and the girl he likes, as well as just the general damage that she caused. Shana also saves Yuji from Felis and ends up defeating her in battle, rendering her unable to fight anymore. The next episode starts and they have a bunch of questions for Felis, and she's trying not to do anything to Yuji anymore because she's powerless against everyone around her, and she ends up being pretty rude to Yoshida, saying that a human doesn't belong in their business, which just adds to Yoshida's internal conflict. Yoshida convinces Felis to spend the day with her so she can prove that they're similar despite being different races, because of the emotion of love or something. After spending the day together, it seems like Felis has had a change of heart, but just as she's about to leave, it's revealed that this was actually a puppet of Felis the whole time because the real Felis needed to become familiar with her enemy, I guess, and then the real Felis comes from the sky and like goes for Yuji again with the same goal as last time, making this episode feel really, really pointless. We're basically back to where we started in episode 13. What did we even accomplish in this episode? It wasn't bad, I guess. It's writing off the quality of the last episode, so you're at least still interested on what's going to happen even if not a whole lot happened, but the very concept and bait and switch here at the end of the episode is just really unnecessary and stupid. But then, oh crap, a freaking arm comes out of Yuji and stabs Felis through the freaking chest and it's awesome! Bro, and like, the arm is covered in armor so you know it's related to the silver somehow, and a seal goes up and it looks like Marjorie is going to extract it from Yuji, and Eita is there with Oga again and he starts to panic because of what happened last time and holy crap, this is amazing! But then, I guess What's-Her-Face is there too. She's moving inside the seal for some reason, which isn't really surprising since she's definitely related to Hakate and Balma somehow, which is immediately confirmed as it cuts to them and they mention a false vessel which can only be What's-Her-Face. But then a freaking giant block falls from the sky and it starts raining tiny blocks and everyone's in danger and Balmas appears and everyone one prepares for battle. But then, whoever she is becomes one with Hakate, and now Hakate has the memories of What's-Her-Face, and I guess that'll be kind of vaguely important for I forget why. Hakate says they need to destroy Yuji now, which is kind of weird because he was essential to their plan last time. But then Yuji, like, turns into Johan and goes to Felis, and the mystery keeps getting deeper, and it's really interesting. Johan asks Felis for some favors that we don't know about. She gives Yoshida a pendant that, when used, will summon Felis and sacrifice Yoshida to do so, and she just leaves. And the end of this whole arc is actually kind of emotional. But then, like, none of the minor characters remember What's-Her-Face after this, and she's never mentioned again by any of the major characters either. No emotional or plot-significant consequences at all. And the time you spent watching those episodes and actually kind of liking her feel like a freaking waste. Five episodes! That's over two hours! <laughs> I know when I watched this for the first time, like, 
10 freaking years ago, I was really upset when she was just thrown away in the trash. The main character's reactions are so weak that it feels like they never cared about her to begin with. Let them feel something a little bit more intense than just saying the equivalent of, oh dang it. And there are just so many questions about her that are left unanswered, like whether or not she was her own person or just a puppet, and it drives me insane. We're just sitting here just wondering what the heck her purpose was for 10 episodes until the terrible anime original ending happens. And that's when we learn that she's kind of slightly somewhat related to their grand master plan a little bit. So after the episodes with Felis, the series continues to hit high and low points, but is overall decent. Much better than the first half of season 1. Leading up to the last two episodes, Shauna and Yoshida's rivalry surrounding Yuji is a lot less contentious as they have become very good friends. But they decide that Yuji needs to pick one of them as a love interest and to do it by Christmas. They both leave him love letters that say to meet them at different places, both at the same time, and how that will decide which one of them he loves. So Yuji comes to the assigned area and is now forced to pick a love interest, which I would start talking about how that's a terrible thing to force upon a person, but there's no time to think about that because Akate shows up and just casually steals the Midnight Lost Child. Okay, but has it always been this easy to steal this thing considering how often they needed it or Yuji in the past? I guess it doesn't matter because without the Midnight Lost Child, Yuji's flame is going to run out. The mad scientist from Balmoth that I've failed to mention yet explains in 10 seconds that everything that's happened in season 2 thus far has actually been this huge setup for this grand plan, and even managed to squeeze some of season 1 into how masterful their planning has been. Felis appearing was part of their plan, because during the confusion they placed a tracker on the Midnight Lost Child. Even though they were planning on killing Yuji just in case you forgot, the silver who crawled out of Yuji? Yep, all according to plan, for sure. Most definitely didn't make this crap up on the spot or anything. Their goal in doing all this is to create a denizen within the human world. Like, a super strong one, I guess. For some reason. Hold on, there has to be a reason, right? It has to be here somewhere. Just one line of dialogue will suffice. Oh no, that is probably bad, is as good as we get. They say this will help them fulfill the Grand Order, but it doesn't go into detail on how, and at this point in the anime, the audience doesn't even know what the Grand Order is yet. It's only been mentioned a few times in Season 2, only being referred to as some sort of plan. A plan, by the way, that isn't this plan, which purpose is revealed in Season 3, and when looking back in retrospect, makes absolutely no sense at all. So the villains and Yuji are in this strange seal, and Shauna and company take 12 and a half minutes to try and figure out how to get inside of it. There's a lot of buildup going on for this being a huge deal, and it really feels like a finale as there is a lot at stake and there's a lot going on. If you didn't know what the episode count was, you'd assume that there'd be at least 4 or 5 episodes left. Yuji is running around trying to find the Midnight Lost Child that was formed within the seal, Shauna and company finally enter the seal, a bunch of exposition happens, they start fighting and that lasts for another 12 minutes and will continually be cut back to, Shauna finds Yuji and they look for the Midnight Lost Child together, Yoshida has her own thing going on where she's trying to decide whether to use the charm Felis gave her, Shauna and Yuji are too late and the silver becomes a living being using the Midnight Lost Child, which like also creates some kind of armor kaiju from the ball of steel they're in, it shatters the seal they were in and the city is in danger and they have to set up another seal, Shauna and Yuji begin fighting the suit of armor within the kaiju armor. Holy crap, there's just a lot going on right now. It really makes you wonder just how they're going to overcome this. They just kill it immediately and dip. Yep. By the time all this buildup happens and the fight between the suit of armor happen, there is literally less than 3 minutes left of the last episode of season 2. So you already know just by looking at the time that there's no way that this is going to end in a satisfactory way. And just how did they justify the armor being so freaking easy to kill? Freaking what's her face. Yeah, just in case you were curious about how what's her face fits into all this. They use her as a vessel to collect emotions, I guess, and they use those emotions as the brain of the silver with the midnight lost child as its core, quote unquote. Her whole five episode existence led up to her emotions being part of a suit of armor, whose reason for existing was never fully explained, by the way. So when they start fighting the armor, memories of what's her name start appearing in the suit of armor and it stops fighting them, which would have been cool if there weren't only a few minutes left. Ignoring the fact that emotions do not equal memories, having whoever she is and her memories manifest themselves in the suit of armor could have been sick. But what I just told you is the extent of what happens. There is no emotional payoff for this concept at all. Shauna and Yuji don't realize that it's the friend they spent five episodes with. The armor never takes the identity of what's her face and the extent of its actions are mistaking Shauna for a bird. Instead of the silver holding back because it's the friends that she cares about from its memories, she's just confused 
confused at what's happening and dies. Shauna and Yuji never find out what's happening with the armor, so there is no emotional attachment or remorse for the friend that they had to kill and immediately go back to whatever they were doing before. They go about their merry way and continue to never think about her again. It never came full circle. Her entire existence was to end the last episodes as fast as possible. It's all just so anticlimactic. So the baddies leave and everything is fixed immediately and then the credits play as the girls are waiting for Yuji to make his decision. It ends vaguely enough to make you think that he picked Shauna, but also vaguely enough that it could be interpreted as anything they want just in case they can make a third season. Which they did end up doing, four years later. They waited for the light novel to finish before starting the adaptation, and with four years comes many more volumes and developments to the story, which ended up making the ending of season two really awkward since there would be multiple things that would make no sense going forward if they wanted to adapt the source material as close as possible. The way they handled this was to ignore the existence of it completely. They reference it as a flashback in a few early episodes, but they just pretend that certain things didn't happen or just expect the audience to not remember every detail since it's been so long. Yeah, them killing the silver didn't actually happen. It was just a fever dream or something because the first time Marjorie appears in season three, she's contemplating about how she's going to find the silver. It seems like Balmosk had a plan B, I guess, because they've been attacking various important Flame Haze locations since season two. And that seems really weird considering Shauna stopped their huge, gigantic, genius plan recently. What the heck were they trying to do in the finale of season two if they had this other grand plan? Oh hey, do you remember freaking Sophie? What? No? Come on, guys. Shauna and Sophie go way back. And Shauna freaking loves her. She's like a mentor to Shauna. She's an important side character. Don't you remember? Hey, did you like the slice of life aspect of the first two seasons? Well, screw you, because the Flame Haze are at war now. It's their second war with the Denizens. There's no time for school or romance. Come on, guys. You remember the first war, right? The Great War? Guys, seriously, this is an important part of the lore. In fact, we have all these returning characters from the first war that everyone in the West definitely had a chance to see, who could forget such legendary characters like purple guy, blonde haired guy, cowboy guy, and uh, bard guy. Come on guys, get your acts together. Season 3 is where not having the source material for previous story arcs starts hurting the most. JC staff didn't actually make up any of this crap. They started following the source material as closely as possible, but because they started following the light novel to a T, they had to deal with the consequences of the decisions they made beforehand, like not introducing important side characters, not including important arcs, changing things in the story, skipping entire volumes of content, and so on. Take Sophie for example. When the audience is introduced to her, it feels as if the writers were just sitting around and thinking about how great it would be if Shauna had a mentor type person for the plot points that are coming up. So just adding one last minute and pretending she's an important character in her life would conveniently help with that. Except, Sophie was introduced in volume 10 of the light novel. So if you came into season 3 having read the source material, suddenly Sophie's introduction makes a lot more sense. She's a returning character now rather than a plot convenience. But anime only watchers just have to deal with this new character they've never seen or heard of before, all because the anime decided not to adopt the Great War chapters. And that decision hurts them in many more ways than just Sophie. While some of these characters are brand new, like the beetle, the kid, the lion, etc., a lot of these characters introduced in season 3 first appeared in earlier volumes or chapters that weren't adapted. With those volumes and the information they contain, suddenly the war has a lot more weight. But because anime-only watchers are completely out of the loop, these once again feel like a slew of new characters characters introduced all for the sake of the new war. But hey, in case you forgot, I briefly mentioned that the 10th volume of the light novel has a manga adaptation. If you did forget about me saying that, then you probably also forgot that only half of it was fan translated. But at least we have a way to be introduced to at least some of these characters before season 3, even if we can't read how that war ends. Which brings up another aspect that seems to come out of nowhere, the actual storyline. We went from the usual flame haze business, along with Yuji needing to pick between Shauna and Yoshida, to Yuji becoming the main antagonist with denizens in Flame Haze on the verge of a massive war. Like, where did this even come from? Well, despite season 2 having an anime original ending, the last few minutes of that did come from the light novel. That season ended on volume 14. So, naturally, the next volume to adapt would, of course, be volume 16. I mean, they've skipped volumes before, but this one could explain the sudden genre shift from the slice of life aspect of the series. In the light novel, we have access to Yuji's thoughts and feelings, more plot and character developments, and so on that probably made the shift in tone and the story less of a gut punch. Not that I could 
tell you for sure or anything since I can't read the light novels. But honestly, this is more than just skipping volume 15. It's a combination of all the content they skipped over the lifespan of the show. The reason season three is regarded as the worst season by a lot of people is because of that reason. So many things are out of context. However, I don't hold that opinion. Despite all the criticisms I laid out, season three is good. Like, really good. It's actually a well-told story. Season 3 has been my favorite season of Shauna before I even knew that it was the only season that closely followed the source material. I feel like the flaws of season 3 aren't nearly as offensive as the first two seasons, and the fact that the majority of these supposed flaws are because of how unfaithful the first two seasons are to the source material makes me wonder if they'd still be flaws or not if we actually got decent adaptations for those seasons. I wish... I could just read the light novel and then go straight to season 3. It has so many cool concepts and great moments, but the caveat is that it's really easy to get lost with some of the lore that isn't directly related to the main storyline. The slice of life aspect has more or less served its purpose with introducing Yuji's daily life, important side characters, and Shauna's overall development from a stoic flame haze to an actual person. And with that aspect of the show out of the way, they can finally focus on the core concept that the show is built around. The main focus this time around is Yuji and Shauna their relationships, and their now differing goals. Even with so many characters being introduced, the focus is still around the characters we already know, and they're able to carry the show until we finally get to know these other characters. A lot of depth is given to the world the series has built up, giving Balmosk actual reasoning for their actions, which ends up being inconsistent because of what happened in the first two seasons, but whatever. And the biggest improvement from the first two seasons, and what made me enjoy the season so much more, is... Ugh, I can't believe I'm about to say this. Yuji is so freaking cool. He just shows up out of nowhere after being gone for a few episodes and he's suddenly like the coolest character in the show. It's like the biggest heel turn ever in anime. He went from the most annoying character ever to this and it's so weird. He suddenly has complex motives, joining Balmoth for reasons that are unknown to Shauna and the audience. He shows up and just freaking curb stomps everyone by himself because he made a contract with the most powerful crimson god. And everyone is confused and thinks Yuji is being brainwashed and like at this point we don't know if that's true or not, and it's really interesting. He's not the stupid, needy, irritating, wishy-washy doofus like he was before. He has determination now, very forward with his goals, and he's not letting anyone get in his way. Not even the person he's doing this for. To be with only Shauna in this fight, he just breaks Marjorie's brain by telling her what the silver actually is. How it's a manifestation of one's desires, and that's why it took everything Marjorie wanted to do, and she quite literally loses the will to live. He defeats Shauna with no effort at all, takes her, and just leaves. He then goes goes to get the crystal altar that's been used since Fryagne and I never told you. <laughs> There's just so many things in this series, I'm sorry, okay? Yoshida just happens to be there too, and asks Yuji why he never gave them an answer at Christmas when he was supposed to choose one of them. Yuji just straight up says that he didn't want to hurt her feelings and that he's always loved Shauna, and leaves all while carrying an unconscious Shauna in his arms. Anytime Yuji was on screen, I was captivated. This season, like the last two, does have its dull moments, but when Yuji shows up, you know that something interesting is going to happen to further the story. The mystery to Yuji's plan and motives slowly unravel. At the beginning of the season, he assures Shauna that this is all for her sake, for the greater good of all Flame Haze and Denizens, so we at least know some of his motives, and the way he describes it makes his motives make a lot more sense. シャナは好きな人全員を守りきれる。知り合い全員にフレームヘイズの護衛をつけられる。この世界は守りきるには広すぎる。こんなにも守らなければならない人たち。高滅の道具でしかない君もその中にいる。どこまでも戦い続け、
ここに大明の最終段階世は狭間にこの世の写しを無給の天地全てをかたどること尽きることのない存在の力にあふれる何時らのための楽園友柄に都合の良い世界を作るとさいけないのであります Ball Mosk are essentially the good guys and have been all along, though the show definitely makes it less black and white than good versus evil. I don't know exactly how the light novel portrayed Ball Mosk, but when we finally do understand what their plan was, creating a separate world for denizens with all the power of existence they need, it's kind of weird how absolutely rotten to the core evil they were portrayed as in the anime beforehand. The Flame Haze do end up finding a few things wrong with Ball Mosk's plan, and in the final battle want to come to some agreement or middle ground, which does end up being for the greater good. A lot of flame haze and denizens die this season, and I kind of wish death as a concept was explored more fully since it's one of the reasons Yuji is doing the things he's doing. I think it'd benefit the anime more if the denizens in particular were given more depth as a people rather than the ruthless killers they were portrayed as in the anime beforehand. It's not that their entire species was evil, they just needed power of existence to survive. It was much more survival of the fittest for them than we thought, but it's not really explored. And as a result, so many of the denizens that die in this war just seem meaningless. One death in particular should have been a lot more impactful than it was, with there being a lot of information about that character and his past that the anime just assumes that we know. But again, because it's out of context, the whole thing seems out of place. And for me, that might be one of the reasons why I seem so accepting of the flaws of this season. They seem to be anime exclusive. If you were to read the light novel and then go straight to season 3, these problems suddenly aren't present. All the problems I laid out in season 3, and the reasons why people have such a huge problem with it kind of just disappear when you have the context of the light novel. I can't absolutely confirm that since I can't read it, but most of these unfamiliar characters were introduced in volume 10 or earlier. We had access to Yuji's thoughts and feelings in the light novel, which would give us a lot greater insight on his decision to join Ball Mosk. And the genre shift was probably a lot more gradual than it was in the anime. If JC staff were just faithful to the source material, this season wouldn't nearly be as hated as it is. And honestly, that's the biggest reason why not being able to read the source material hurts so much. There are just so many things I like about this season that it really sucks to consider that the rest of the anime could have been this good. It's so weird, man. This is one of the only situations I can think of for a once popular series where you can't experience the source material in the West. With Little Busters, I can recommend the visual novel over the anime. And even before the official translation of the visual novel came out, there was a fan translation. With 9 hours, 9 persons, 9 doors, I can recommend the DS version over the lack Cluster port. With Final Fantasy 2, there are so many versions I can recommend over the NES version that are just straight up a better experience. With Shakugan no Shana, there is no easy way to recommend it without mentioning everything. The light novel has two volumes officially translated and then scattered fan translations of other volumes. The manga goes on for 10 volumes and adapted the light novel until volume 4. There was another manga adaptation that covers volume 10 and went on for 36 chapters, only half of which are available to us by fan translation. The first first two seasons of the anime are full of terrible original content, retconning that content, not introducing important characters and plot elements, and skipping over multiple volumes, making the ending season really confusing for a lot of people with things seemingly making no sense. What am I supposed to do? Unless you want to go out of your way to read the first two volumes of the light novel, then volume 7 through 10 of the manga, then the anime from episode 14, then half of the other manga when you finish season 2, then the various scattered other volumes of the light novel that were fan translated, and then go back to the anime for season 3. You know how much of that is actually legal? Well, I'll remind you! The two volumes of the light novel that are now out of print, and the anime. You might as well not even try to attempt to experience the series in any other way. Not unless you want to go searching online for torrents and fan sites that you need to dig deep for. The best hope we have is to learn Japanese. Yeah, I can't wait to learn Japanese for more than half a decade for the sole purpose of reading one series. Maybe in the future we'll have a dedicated fan to translate them, as huge of a task as that is. Perhaps we'll get another, more faithful adaptation in like 20 freaking years. But most likely, we'll just have to accept that we will never be able to experience Shauna in its original form. Viz dropped the official translation of the light novel after sales were low, and no one has picked it up since then. It's just... really sad. 
because underneath the garbage that the first two seasons have, you can see glimpses of brilliance. And from what I've read of the light novel and manga, there is a legitimately good series here. It's such a shame because this is a series that I grew up with, one of the first anime I watched, one that I love, even with the problems I have with the first two seasons. To think that there's a series of light novels that could end up being some of my favorites that may never be translated fills me with a unique kind of sorrow. I'm not used to things being inaccessible, but Shakugan no Shana is the first time where I feel helpless that I'll never be able to experience this series in its original form. 